okay, now, uh, okay, so I've told you so far about humanization, sort of being able to turn on and off, and then a very particular example of, of empathy where you're simulating what it's like to be someone else, and how that can be modulated. Now I want to drill down a little bit deeper into the heart of some of the issues, which is that when you look at people who are behaving in these very violent acts throughout history, the assumption has been for a long time, well, it's something about the disposition of those people. There's something really wrong with those people. But this started coming into question because there were so many hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people participating in this. And it's a funny theory to say, well, all of them had something wrong with their brain. Instead, what it led people to think is maybe there are situational forces that can make people behave in these incredibly awful ways. So there's something to be understood about these situational forces here of social context that cause people to behave a certain way. And, and of course, what this leads to is the question of, could I behave that way if I were in a situation? And this makes us all very uncomfortable to even think about it because we know that we're good people and we're not gonna behave in these sorts of ways. Um, but the reason that it's an important question to ask is because social psychologists got really interested in what was happening with what came to be known as the banality of evil. So after World War II, for example, here's Adolf Eichmann on trial. You know, he was one of the main coordinators of the final solution for the Jewish population. He had the blood of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people on his hands. And the thing is, as Hannah Arendt put it as she covered his trial, she called this the banality of evil because there was nothing particularly special about Eichmann. He said, I was just doing my job, right? He was part of this machinery. He, was, he had an opportunity to impress you know, his wife and people around him. He, everybody else was doing that. There were all kinds of situational forces acting on him. This is no defense of his behavior, but what it does encourage us to, us to do is try to understand what are these situational forces that steer whole populations of people to do incredible things that in other situations you would never even consider. And this is why the whole issue of situational forces came to the forefront. So right after World War II, there was a, a research psychologist named Solomon Ash, and he decided, I want to understand how it is that social forces can change people's decision making. So he did a very simple experiment. He, you, you come in to, to participate in an experiment, and you see that there are seven other people there to participate as well, just like you. And, um, and you guys are all shown a line on the screen of a certain length. And then you're shown a second screen and asked, okay, which, which line matches in length there? And so you have to pick which line you think is the, of the same length. Okay, but it just so happens that you're sitting in the eighth chair, and so the first person registers his answer, and then the next person registers her answer, and so on, and on down the line. And it turns out that all these people are shills. They're all plants from the experimenter. They're not just like you, even though they appear to be just like you. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll all say the wrong answer, but they'll all say it confidently. They'll maybe pick the shortest line there, and they'll say, oh yeah, it's definitely the top one. And you know it's not. You know it's that middle one, but everybody in front, person number one, person number two, number three, they're all saying that. And so what do you do when it comes time for your turn? Are you going to say, you know what? You guys are all wrong. It's the middle one. Or do you think, gosh, there's something wrong with me? Now, what happened is um, Solomon Ash figured that probably a lot of people, he didn't even think this would work. He figured people would go ahead and stick with what they thought was the right answer. But the results were shocking, which is that almost everybody conformed to the group. Whatever the group was doing, they were reluctant to do otherwise, even though this was a clear, easy, perceptual task with a right and a wrong answer. So what happened is Ash had a student in his lab, a young man named Stanley Milgram, who, who watched this, and, and uh, Milgram, also being Jewish and having seen what just happened in World War II, was very interested in these issues, but he saw that there was no you know, social consequence to this experiment. It's not a moral decision of any sort. It's just a very simple perceptual decision. And he decided to do something um, that drilled a lot deeper. And so it's one of the most famous experiments in psychology, but not everyone knows the details. So let's just walk through this. So, so first of all, you see an ad, and it says, you know, come, we're studying something about memory. Studying about memory, come, we'll pay you. Okay, so you show up to the thing, and you're told, okay, great, you're, you're going to sit here. You're the teacher. And there's a learner over here on the other side of this glass, um, uh, or, or on the other side of the wall, so you can't actually see him. You see him get strapped in, but 
But what happens with the learner is, this is a study on the effect of uh, punishment on how well you can learn something. So the learner comes in, and he gets strapped into a chair with a device that gives him an electrical shock. And, you, and whenever he gets the right answer, the experimenter goes on to the next one. Whenever he gets the wrong answer, your job is to deliver an electrical shock. So here's the learner here. This happens to be Mr. Wallace, was this guy's name. He gets strapped in. The experimenter is here. You're sitting over here in this other room. And in your room, you've got this device here. OK. So what happens is you're told, when he gets the wrong answer, I want you to hit the lowest level of shock. So, so that's pretty straightforward instructions. He's going along. He's trying to learn the associations between different pairs of words. He gets the wrong answer. Bzz, you give him a mild shock. And it's labeled. It says mild shock at this end of the day. OK. So he's going along. He gets another wrong answer. You're told, OK, each time he gets another wrong answer, you have to increase the level of the shock. So you hit the second button. OK, this goes on. Every time he gets the wrong answer, you have to go up. Well, you notice that as you look up towards the right side of the box, this is, this is an actual photograph of it. It goes to extreme intensity. And at the right side, it goes to severe shock. OK, so you're a little worried about this. As, as he's going along, you're hoping that he'll get the right answer, that you won't have to do this. But what happens is you're being asked to give Harder and harder shocks. Well, what happens is even at the low end here, when you give a shock, the guy says, you hear the guy, he says, ow. And as you're going up higher, he says, ow, that really hurt. And as you go up higher, he says, let me out of here. I don't want to be a part of this experiment. So you look pleadingly to the experimenter, and the experimenter in his white coat there says, keep going. So maybe you keep going. So you keep going. And the guy says, ow, I want out of here. Let me out. And the experimenter says to you, keep going. And you say, I don't want to keep going. He's obviously in pain. And the experimenter says, don't worry. I will take full responsibility here. You are not responsible for any of this. You're just participating in this experiment. So the question is, how high do you keep going? So at some point, when you're around here, he stops responding. You don't hear anything anymore. You press the button. You don't hear any cries anymore. Is he unconscious? Is he dead? You're not getting any response at all. OK, so the question is, will people keep going even beyond that level? Will anybody go all the way to the top? So what Stanley Milgram did is he went and talked to a group of psychiatrists. And he said, what's your prediction? How high, how many people do you think will go all the way to the top and give someone the strongest electrical shock, even though the person's at this point already unconscious or maybe dead? And so the psychiatrist said, 1% was their prediction. Because the psychiatrists are experts in human nature, and they're thinking about this in a dispositional way. In other words, who has that disposition that they'd be able to do that? Only somebody who's clearly psychopathic. It's somebody maybe it's only makes up 1% of the population. So who's going to do that? So it turns out that 65% of Milgram's subjects went all the way to the top. They delivered 450 volt shocks to this pretend subject over there. So Milgram published a book, one of the most famous books in this area, called Obedience to Authority. Because he couldn't believe this. He couldn't believe that people would listen to him all the way up to the very top, where they were perhaps killing somebody that's a total stranger to them, who had done nothing to them. And in the book, he did 19 different versions of the experiment to, to tweak every possible parameter here. And he figured out particular rules, like if you actually have to be closer to the learner, then compliance goes down. If you have to actually see him, he's near you. Um, similarly, if the experimenter is farther away from you, then compliance also goes down. And, and in the extreme case, if the experimenter is just talking to you on a telephone, the compliance only drops to 20%. 20% is still really high for delivering these sorts of electrical shocks. He did this with women participants instead of men. And even though the women expressed more stress about it, they still did exactly as much shocking. 65% of them went up to the top. He wanted to make sure that this had nothing to do in particular with Yale University, where he was from. He wanted to make sure it was something about the academic prestige. So he set up an office in downtown New Haven, Connecticut. And he just rented some random office space. And just said he was a random researcher. And people still complied just as much. So he figured out all of these different things going on here. And, and, and this, was a, this was one of the most shocking illustrations of how easy it is to get people from the social context to listen to, to authority. Now, it turns out that there 
is another kind of social influence too, which is the influence of your peers. And it happens that Milgram had a high school friend named Philip Zimbardo. Milgram ended up at Yale, Zimbardo ended up working at Stanford, and, and he was really interested in the same problem. And so he did, Zimbardo did what's the other most famous experiment in psychology, which is the Stanford prison experiment. So what he did is he recruited people. He was very interested in how prison systems run and why people behave the way they do in prisons. So he recruited people for a two-week study, and he said, look, we will pay you for your time. You'll either be randomly assigned to the role of a guard or a prisoner. He did full psychological tests on people so that he was sure that he had everybody in a normal range, essentially random research participants. There was nothing particular about them. And he randomly assigned half of them to be guards and half to prisoners. And the guards, he gave them things like, you know, uh, glasses to cover their eyes. He gave them billy clubs, stuff like that. The prisoners, he stripped of all their clothing except for uh, a simple gown. And he made things as realistic as possible. So he actually picked up the prisoners in police cars and brought them in and had them handcuffed and so on and checked in. And he had three different shifts of guards that would switch off every eight hours, whereas the prisoners actually lived there in this basement which was set up to be just like a jail cell. And many of you probably know the outcome of this experiment, which is that he had to shut it down early because right away, the prisoners and the guards fell into these roles and the guards started acting so brutally towards the prisoners and so creatively evil in coming up with, with punishments and rules and so on that everybody involved became psychologically traumatized. I mean, very quickly the guards were stripping the prisoners naked, getting, you know, taking away food from them, taking their beds away, um, locking them in solitary confinement, making them do lots of um, arbitrary things. So they had to line up to count off, to do this count off thing. And that was a perfect time for the guards to make up arbitrary rules just to torture them. Say, okay, now you have to do it backwards. Now you have to sing. No, you're not singing sweetly enough. You have to do it again. And they would do this for hours and just torture these guys. And what happened is everybody was completely shocked and turned upside down by the results of this experiment because these were just normal young men who by being put in these roles ended up behaving so differently. And, and Zimbardo wrote a great book on this called The Lucifer Effect about how people can turn into such bad actors um, uh, in, in situations. And what Zimbardo really emphasized is, look, there's this real situational thing that's going on when you give people particular roles. But it's not just that, it's that you have to understand the whole system, right? Because what happens in prisons is not unique to the Stanford prison experiment. This is what always happens in prisons because the whole system is set up this way where you've got the guards and the prisoners and they've got their roles and the guards want total compliance and the prisoners want to resist that and so the guards will keep upping the arms race until they're absolutely certain they can get the compliance from the prisoners. And therefore, it is no surprise what happened in Abu Ghraib, where, where photographs emerged of torture and humiliation of, of insurgents being held there. So this is exactly the kind of stuff that happened in the Stanford prison experiment. Here's two guys being uh, stripped naked and humiliated, men being terrorized by dogs. Um, here's a man who was told that he's going to be electrocuted as soon as he loses his strength and falls off of this box. I'm sorry, the slide's cut off, but what's over here is an American soldier who's uh, dealing with his digital camera to take a picture. And of course, there's someone else taking this picture here. Zimbardo's point is, it's not as easy as thinking about this as a few bad apples in the system, which is how the army tried to portray this. They said, we are shocked at what happened in Abu Ghraib. There were obviously some bad apples in this situation who behaved badly. And Zimbardo's point is, it's not that. It's a systemic problem. It's a system that sets up particular situations. Again, this is not in defense of the people who did this, but it is important to try to figure out how to build or repair these systems so that this doesn't happen. And just uh, about 30 days ago now, um, I was walking through the airport and heard CNN that, that several more pictures had just emerged of soldiers who were posing with dead members of the Taliban, uh, and posing with them doing things, having them hand on them and so on, and some things with body parts. And so what I thought was interesting is the headlines. So in the LA Times, it said, photo of US soldiers posing with Afghan corpses, uh, yeah, prompts condemnation. And the subtitles, American officials denounce the actions of troops photographed with dead insurgents and their body parts. 
give me a break. The idea is the army says, look, we want you to go over there. We want you to kill these guys, wreck their roads, burn their bridges, but don't take any pictures with them because that's disrespectful. Now, the thing is, they can't, this act is pretending that there's condemnation going on here is so silly because it's part of the system. It's part of the situational variables that get set up here. You set up these young men and women to have vim and vigor and go out and kill the enemy and so on. You've got propaganda. You dehumanize the enemy and so on. And then you say, oh, we are outraged. We're shocked that something like this could happen. And by the way, just as a quick side note, it turns out that with digital photography, these things surface and everyone thinks it's some awful new thing. But this is as old as war itself. People always pose with the dead bodies of their enemies. I mean, this goes way back. And before photography, they would do things like cut off people's ears or take out teeth or stuff like that and make belts and necklaces out of this. There is nothing new going on here. Again, this is not a defense of that behavior, but it is to say there's something about the situational variables that change the way people make decisions in these situations. Mm -hmm.